All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, good morning to you. I hope you had a good weekend, and I hope the time change didn't affect you too much. Um, I think we're all dragging a little bit. At least I know I am. Today, we're going to continue in our world of Adobe Illustrator. And the primary thing that we'll talk about today is logo design, because it's a good way of kind of working out your skills in Illustrator, practicing a little bit more with the pen tool. We'll work today with something called the Pathfinder tools. And the Pathfinder tools are about how shapes combine together or break apart. Um, and so we'll work through those. We'll do a little bit of, of line weights, though that shifts uh, a little bit later in the Illustrator section. Um, next class, we'll start talking about your upcoming Illustrator assignment. So we move right along into the Illustrator part of things. Um, so you'll, we'll go through that and, and kind of get the ball rolling on that project. We're coming up here on spring break, not too far out. So um, I do want you to know that I'm not making your assignment 104 due the Monday when you get back from spring break. I think that's just cruel punishment for you. So it'll be due on the Wednesday after spring break. So you have a little bit more time. Um, but I'd just like to throw that out there in case people want to get started on it. We'll really cover it in depth next class. So on Wednesday, we'll talk a lot about that. I saw a lot of good first starts at portfolios. When you guys turned in your last exercise, that's excellent. Hopefully in the check-ins, we'll talk a little bit more about portfolios, give you some more individual feedback on those uh, as well. So let's move on into logo design. And I think logo design is one of those really fun things. You can go down a lot of little rat holes about logo design and uh, get excited about it. But an effective logo is fundamentally something that's distinctive and recognizable. It's something that's appropriate to the brand should be relatively practical. You want it to be graphic. So something that grabs your attention. And I think simple is a good thing, but not all logos are simple. And we'll get into some of the ones that aren't so simple. And sometimes they wanna convey some kind of an intended message. So as you start to design this, you wanna think about logos are all around us constantly. And I'm throwing up tons of examples today, but by no means is this a comprehensive list of examples because pretty much every brand or every uh, company has some kind of a logo that's associated with it. And they spin off these logos in different ways and it's, it's recognizable. Simplicity is also something that's pretty important. It needs to be something that's easily recognizable, pretty versatile, it needs to go in a lot of places. You wanna think about something that goes on, on, on you know, the, the big size of a billboard, something that's small that shows up on, you know, the back of a phone. You know, what are these, this variety of sizes here? And what makes it memorable? What makes it something that, that people will come back to and say, oh yeah, of course that's that particular brand because it's so recognizable. Sometimes they feature something unexpected or unique and that ends up being the surprise. This one is one of those funny ones because we obviously recognize this. The Starbucks logo is everywhere. You can't, you can't go out of your house without seeing the Starbucks logo. But if you really stop and look at it, it has absolutely nothing to do with coffee, like at all. So it's kind of a funny logo in that context because it really doesn't have anything to do with what they're selling. Furthermore, it's pretty complicated. I think most people here probably have never spent that much time looking at this. You just recognize it as the Starbucks logo. Some of these logos that I'm gonna throw in today, and I apologize, this one's a little bit blurry, are fake logos. They're just for fun. But some of them are kind of creative and kind of entertaining. I love this one, the fish bomb fishing shop. Like I'd, I'd like to own that shop. You also wanna think about what's enduring about a logo. So you don't wanna follow some fad. You wanna make sure that it is in fact a future-proof logo, that it can end up appearing for years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, that's all really, really important. How about this? What if this logo was on the back of all our computers and phones? It's kind of interesting. This was the original Apple Computer Company logo back in the 70s. And then of course it evolved into much more of what we see. So we've got the rainbow logo that was from 1976 to 1998. That's a long period of time with that rainbow logo. And then we moved into the monochrome Then we had the shiny Apple logos. And now we're back to the monochrome, but it's the reverse monochrome where we have just the white Apple logo. 
So it's interesting to think about how these play out over time. How does a logo survive over time? So the logo design process, very much like any design process, we generally start with a design brief, followed by some further research, followed by some reference studies. Then we get into the big, the big ticket, and that's sketching and conceptualizing, figuring out what this logo is going to look like, reflecting back on that logo that you designed, and then finally presenting it to the client. So here it is in kind of a Venn diagram form where we talk about how long each of these phases are. And I think this is an important one to point out in that the sketching and conceptualizing part is really the big part of this. Research is also pretty big and so is revision. So those might be the big, the big three steps right there. So we talked, first step is that design brief. So if you're designing a logo for somebody, you want to first start by kind of questioning the client, questioning the person you're designing the logo for. For today, you're going to be designing your own logo, so you can question yourself about it. What is the intended purpose of this logo? What are you trying to identify? What makes this logo you? Think about where it's going to be included. Is it going to be on a letterhead? Is it going to be on a business card? Is it going to be on a t-shirt? Those are all things that matter because if you think about that, you can start to design around that. It's also a good time if you're designing for somebody else to discuss the fear or cost for your services. Now, in the context of you designing today for yourself, you can charge yourself whatever fee you want. That's okay with me. Then we move into that second stage and that's the research stage. So what industry does this logo belong in? Is it architecture? Is it industrial design? Are you going to be a designer? Or is it something else? Are you in construction? So you think about what is that, where does it belong? And then what other logos are used in the industry? So if you were creating an architecture firm logo, it would kind of make sense to go out and see what the other architecture firm's logos are. It gives you background context. Also, you want to ask yourself, what is the history of the previous logos relating to this person or entity? In the case of you, did you draw your own logo in Arch Architecture 130? A lot of times that's one of the assignments. Did you create a logo? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Are you like Apple Computer where you created that first logo and you realized a year later that that was not the right logo and you want to switch? What are your competitors using for logos? What are other students using as logos? What are other people in this class drawing as logos? Those are all important. Then we move into that reference stage. This is beyond just your industry. What are successful logo designs? You could Google logo designs. There's a great article I'll show you a little bit later. There's a website that puts together logo design trends for the year. And we'll look at that a little bit later in the lecture. That's a good place to start. What are current styles being used? Are they flat? Are they three-dimensional? How trendy is your logo going to be? Then you move into the sketching and conceptualizing phase. This is where you're developing those design concepts. What does this logo look like? Different options. What if I did this? What if I did that? You're exploring a variety of ideas and you're trying to trust that intuition. Remember, we talked about that in the graphic design part where what, what is your backside of your brain, the, the non-conscious part telling you, eh, that's working, that's not working. And then, of course, you fall back on those previous two steps, the research and the reference steps. So you go back and revisit it and then keep drawing. You produce lots and lots of ideas, especially in logo design. You want to throw out all kinds of ideas. And then you start to develop it into a real idea. So here's an example, right? You start with a photograph in this context. You do some sketching on that particular photograph. Kind of abstract that a little bit more, abstract it a little bit more, bring over into Illustrator, start actually working in Illustrator, start to create this shape in abstract form, start to adjust colors, a little bit more information here. Ultimately, maybe you're adding some fonts to create the overall logo. Now, this is great because they're thinking about a color version, a grayscale version, and a black and white version. And they're thinking about where this logo would go. Stationary, letterhead, 
I guess, letterhead stationery, the same thing, envelope, business card. Those are all important places where this might go. Another example here, sketching and conceptualizing, getting the idea out, starting to think about what it would look like, then starting to actually create it. Thinking about font choice. Now, of course, these are all very, very similar fonts, but which one's the right one? Which one feels best? So really thinking about that choice rather than just picking defaults. And then ending up with the final logo. This one's also interesting because they have a color version and then they have a, a grayscale version. And I think this one's important because this logo up here, if you just converted it to grayscale, it wouldn't look very good. It'd be kind of mushy. But what they've done is they've adapted it into a grayscale version by just adding these little lines along the way. And those little lines give it the 3D effect without using the gradient. And I think that's a very nice touch. So thinking about what it looks like in color and also what it looks like in black and white. Then you move into that reflection phase. You're stepping away from your work, revisiting it with a fresh perspective. What's working? What's not working? Ask your neighbors or colleagues for their opinion. This is another thing that I'll invite you to do during your check-in today and on Wednesday. Show your logo. See what other people think of your logo. Because a lot of times when other people look at your logo, they have different ideas. I had a student, this was back when we were in person. I had a student work really hard on her, on her logo and she was really proud of it and it turned out great. And then she showed it to her neighbor and her neighbor said, well, you know, that's the Beats logo, right? She's like, no, I had no idea. Like the headphone logo. Well, it was, and she didn't know it. So she had kind of subconsciously channeled that. And so seeing somebody else's perspective, a lot of times can help you reflect back on your work. There are just other examples. I love the rabbit logo, the, the hands or the rabbit. This is one of those things where you can either see the hands or you can see the rabbit. It's one or the other. So some of these I'm just flipping through just to give you an idea. And then we get to the presentation phase. So this is the phase where you're distilling the best ideas. You make that final version and you go to your client and you say, hey, this is what your new logo is gonna be. And the client's gonna either like it or not like it. And sometimes when they don't like it, you have to go back and start fresh. Sometimes they give you a little bit of critique. Maybe they didn't like the color choice, something small, and you go back and, and make that addition or change. This Mall of America logo is kind of interesting because they have the, the first logo, but then they thought through all kinds of uh, a variety of different logo conditions. So you've got the original, you've got kind of the unwrapped ribbon. Then they change the colors depending on the seasonal changes, 4th of July, Valentine's Day, Christmas, you know, holidays, et cetera. They can change that look and then they can also use it as like backgrounds. So the logo itself is very versatile. I apologize, this slide's blurry, it shouldn't be. I'm not sure what happened. You also wanna learn from others, what brands have succeeded and why. The Nike logo is phenomenal. It's been the same logo forever. They've never had to change it. They've never had to adjust it because it was so well done to begin with. It's also super simple and super recognizable. Everybody knows what that logo is. Typography, a lot of fonts, contain text or characters. So if you're gonna use type in your, in your logo, you wanna think about what's the right font? What's the right style? Will the font go out of style? Is it like papyrus in the you know, mid 2000s? Is it gonna go way out of style and nobody's gonna to wanna to see it again? So you wanna think about that. Does the font reflect the client or the business correctly? Does it match up with what they're trying to sell or do? Maybe you have to just make your own font. Maybe you have to draw your own leather letter to create that logo. And that's certainly something that the pen tool can do in Illustrator. Remember the little details matter, the kerning, the tracking, the spacing, the alignments, all of that really, really matters when you're looking at a, an actual logo. So here's a variety of text-based logos. And those are perfectly valid logos. They contain no graphics. They're just text-based. Now let's look carefully at the FedEx logo. This is one of those moments where 
I, I'm going to show you something that you will never, ever be able to unsee. Now, some of you have already seen this and you, it seems completely obvious. Others of you haven't. The FedEx logo is brilliant. They're about moving packages from one place to another and hidden in their text is a beautiful little arrow because they're about moving. So it's one of those great double, double meanings that's hidden in the logo. So we have that little arrow and the company's about moving things from one place to another. Brilliant, brilliant logo design. So these are just other examples. You also want to make sure that you're avoiding any kind of cliches. So don't go into word clip art and pick something. Don't use a light bulb for an idea or a globe for international. Those have been done. The other thing that you can't do is you can't just copy another logo. You couldn't take the Nike logo and make it yours because it's so obvious. So your logo needs to be unique to you. And that's one of the big challenges with a logo to begin with. So how do we get to the output at the very end? Well, we want to think about making a JPEG. I'm going to have you work today in a 1500 pixel by 1500 pixel size format, and it'll end up being 300 DPI. Now, remember, this is going to be a vector graphic when you create it. So it'll be able to be scaled up or scaled down at different sizes. Very, very easy. Uh, you always save the AI file just in case. And it's always worth considering what does this logo look like in black and white? What does it look like in grayscale? And what does it look like in color? Because those all matter because you won't always be able to do color printing or black and white printing, et cetera. So I'm just flipping through these. This one's just silly. I don't know what happened to all my, my logos in this. They're all kind of blurry. So let's look at this one. This is another one that goes sketching all the way through for a company called Jigsaw Internet. They have their first example here. This looks very dated when you just look at it. How do you adapt it? Okay, this is starting to feel much better. And what about this? Where you're replacing one of the letters with the jigsaw puzzle. This feels much more current. And then you can see it on its business card format. So the logo design trends, this is what I was talking about. And we'll actually look at the current design trends for this year. I'm going to pull that up on the webpage. Um, these are a mixture of everything after 2018. Uh, they're by a company called Logo Lounge, and they do these articles once a year where they show you what the design trends are for the year. And so these are some of the design trends that have happened in the last, uh, say, five years. And so it's worth looking at helping you get in, inspired. And so they, they title what these are. This is the parallelogram, the outline. Modern religion. I'm not sure how that plays out and why they titled it that, but you guys can get a sense. I love that this is the black and white hipster style. Oops, sorry. Gold was really big, shiny gold. Some of these are really, really nicely done where the letters clipped. So let's look at the current ones. And so I've gone ahead and I pulled this up. Hold on, let's. Uh... So like I said, this is from a company called Logo Lounge. And you can actually, if you go to Logo Lounge, they have trends here. And you can go backwards in time and see what the trends were. So we could go to 2020 and see what the 2020 trends are, or we could go to the 2021. This is the current trends. You click on the logo trend report. And he has a long write up here that kind of explains it. It would be worth reading through because he has a nice take on it. And then he goes through and explains. So the asterisk becomes popular. And he kind of talks through what's going on. 
and then the off jog. So the idea something flips. The sliced. And then he, he kind of talks through these various styles. So I think it's worth looking at. I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time uh, Googling this and kind of looking around. And some of these would be more appropriate than others. Like this etch style, if you were a, in, uh, doing an architecture firm, the etch style probably is not quite a, as appropriate as something that's a little bit more graphic in its nature. Um, the other thing, like I said, is you can always go into Google and you can look up, you know, architecture. Oops, sorry. architecture firm logos. And so we could look here, let's just go into images. And you can see all kinds of famous architecture firms and their various logos and how they choose to, to set up those logos. If you were looking at industrial design, you could do the same thing. Type in industrial design firm or landscape firm logos. All right, so it's always worth spending some time and kind of looking through logo design trends. So that's all part of that research phase. So in terms of today, let me minimize these. In exercise 114, you're going to work on creating a logo for yourself. And I'm going to walk you through this in Illustrator, and we'll kind of talk through it. I do have an optional part in here about your color palette. We'll cover color palettes next class a lot more in depth. So it is, in fact, optional. I'm not going to go through it and demo it, but I have that there just in case. Uh, so we'll talk about creating shapes, we'll talk about adding text, and ultimately you'll post your work to Canvas. So let's take a look at Illustrator and as we start to create these logos. So uh, I'm going to open up Illustrator. So we'll give Illustrator a second here. All right, so I'll close that splash screen. I'm gonna create a new file, but I'm gonna go into the more presets button right here. And when I do that, I'm gonna change my units into pixels this time. And like I said, I want it to be 1500 by 1500. So we will change that, come on, 1,500, that's 15,000, there we go, 1,500. Let's try that again, 1,500. So I have 1,500 pixels by 1,500 pixels. I'm not worried about bleed. The color mode can stay CMYK, and my, um, I want it to be 300 PPI here. And so we'll go ahead and click Create. And that gives me my 300 by 300 square. So the idea here is that your logo should take up roughly this whole square as I start to create it out. Now, it doesn't mean that your logo needs to be square. So this is our starting place. If you wanted to do a longer rectangle, you could certainly do that as well. So let's experiment with some shapes. I'm going to start using the rectangle tool right over here. And if I were to draw a rectangle, and again, I'm, I'm playing around with this and I'll, I'll end up adjusting for size a little bit later on, but let's, let's say that I have this rectangle. Now, right now it's currently filled with white and has a black outline. So what I'd like is for it to be filled with a color. So I'm gonna double click the white here and I'll change the color. So let's say I want it to be blue. I don't really want the black outline so I'm going to click on the stroke color here, and I'm going to click this little red slash below it, which makes it none. So now I have a blue rectangle with no outline around it, just the blue rectangle. Let me close this color window here. 
and let me create another shape. And I'm going to click and hold on the rectangle tool, and I'm going to let's do the ellipse tool. And I'm going to create another shape on top of my previous shape, like that. And let's change the color of this shape to something else. And again, it does not have a stroke color on it either. So I have these two shapes and they overlap each other. But what if I want to say, cut the rectangle here with this larger shape? What if I wanna cut that shape out of the rectangle? Well, I can do that using a set of tools called the Pathfinder tools. So let me open up the Pathfinder tools. I'll go to window. And I'm going to come down here from window and choose Pathfinder. So it's window and then Pathfinder. And that brings up this Pathfinder tool. It happens to be in the same tool set as the Align tools. So we can use the Align tools as well. But in the Pathfinder tools, I have a couple things. I have something called Shape Modes. This is where I'm either joining them together. I'm subtracting the front. I'm leaving just the intersection or I'm cutting out the intersection. So let's see what happens. If I were to select both of these shapes like that, if I click on this first one, which says unite, add them all together, when I click on it, they're going to become one shape. See how they transform into one shape. Let me go back. Again, I have these two. If I use this one, the second one here, it's going to subtract what's ever on front, in front. So what is ever on top, it's going to subtract. So it's going to subtract this purple ellipse. So I'll click on that and it'll cut that purple or the, the white square out of it. And I guess I should probably have another example in the background just so you can see that it is in fact transparent. So let's do this. Make this kind of a light gray. And I'm going to arrange and send to back so it's behind everything else. So you can see that when it actually cuts it out, that it's transparent behind. So we've gotten rid of the ellipse and it's left us with just this shape that's left. Uh, I shouldn't have done that in that order. Let's go back to here. Perfect. Let me create that rectangle again behind just so we can see it. Right click arrange, send to back. There we go. So let's select those two objects again. So the blue rectangle and the purple ellipse. And if I use this next one in the shape modes, it's going to give me just the intersection. So when I click on that, it gives me just this piece so where the two intersect. I'm going to go to undo intersect. And the last one, which you can probably guess, is going to be trim out the middle section. So I, I keep this shape and I keep that shape. So these Pathfinder tools are great ways of kind of combining shapes together and getting an end result. So let me go ahead and do edit and then undo the exclude. Now down at the bottom, those were all the shape modes. We can look at the Pathfinders. And this is where we're actually kind of dividing up the objects. So in this case, if I click on divide, it's going to break the object apart. So if I use the direct select tool, the white arrow, I could actually pick, notice that all the parts stay together, they, you know, they're all still exist. It hasn't deleted anything, but it lets me work with any of the individual parts. Let's go back to edit and then undo move. Oh. And one more undo. Okay. So now when we come back to this phase, oops. Let me make sure that they're both selected. There we go, one and two. This next one here is, they call it a trim, and it leaves the front object intact, but it makes the, oops, it makes the back object be trimmed by the front object. Let me go back to, oops. One more edit, undo trim. There we go. And we can work our way here. This next one is the merge. Oops, sorry, I didn't have it selected. So the merge is actually very, very close to this shape mode, where uh, essentially all it's doing is it's combining these two objects together. 
very unfrequently used. Uh, we have our, our crop tool. We can try that one. And that gives us the resulting piece in between. Again, very similar to the pathfinders up above. So you can play around with the others. These are all designed to help you as you start to create your logo. So let's actually go through and, and create some logo, some real logo designs. So let's say that I wanted to start with um, a large square. I can hold down shift to keep it in proportion so it's exactly the same size. Remember, I could also, if I wanted to, if I knew the size, I could single click and type in, let's say 1450 by 1450 and say, okay. And that's gonna give me exactly a 1450 by 1450 uh, little square here. So there it is lined up in the center. So let's say that I wanted to take something out of this. I wanted to, to uh, pull a shape out of it. So I could, um, I could even use the pen tool and I could start up here. I could come down to there. I could come over. And I could come back and I could close that shape. So I've drawn this little diagonal here. Just for ease of seeing it, we'll change the color. And there it is. Now, maybe you want the color to be there, but maybe you want this to be a slice out of your blue rectangle. If I wanted it to be a slice out of the blue rectangle, I could select them both and I could subtract the one that was in front. So I can use minus front. And that's going to cut that out. Remember, this little wedge is now transparent. And that could be the beginning stages of my logo. Maybe I want to add some kind of a piece of text here. I could use the text tool. And I could add a text. Let's say I use a, an A. Oops. Let me select it. We need to come over to my fonts here. First off, we need it to be much larger. So let's say maybe a thousand points. There we go. And I have to choose my font carefully. Remember, there's all kinds of fonts, right? There's something like this all the way to something. We're definitely not using papyrus. Okay, let's say I like this one. Okay, I could change the color of my font. So again, if I selected it, I could change the color of it. To be something else. And then I can start to work with that font and place it where I would want on my logo. So let's say I like it there. Maybe I want that to be cut out. So as it is right now, I can't cut it out because it's a font. But if I like the placement of it, I can actually convert this into an object. So I could go to uh, the type menu, and I could go to create outlines. And that's creates an outline out of this. And at that point, I could select the um, text and the background, and I could do that minus the front, and that would then cut it out. Now, notice I lost this little blue part there. That's because I did them in separate operations. So in this scenario, this background blue object, those are connected together right now. They're one object. So if I wanted to continue to work with the Pathfinder, I need to actually break those apart. So I could come over here with it selected and I could choose ungroup. And it should break those apart so that I can pick one versus the other. If that doesn't work, let's try it here. Select those two and minus the front and see. Yeah, there we go. So it was the fact that they were grouped together that I wasn't able to cut that piece out. So maybe as we're going through this, you start to establish things and you say, you know, I, I don't really like how that turned out. We can go to our layers here and we can create another layer. So I have layer one, come down here and create layer two. I'll make sure that's active. And then I could turn off the first one and say, yeah, that didn't really turn out right. So remember, this is always part of the iterative process. So we'll come back here, create another 1400 by 1400, or excuse me, it was 1450 by 1450. And, you know, in this scenario, maybe I want, let's go back to the type tool. 
and I want it to be GA. And I'm going to go ahead and go to object and I'm going to go to, or excuse me, type, and then I'll go to create outlines. And we'll move this down so that it's right on the bottom there. And then we'll take this and the background and we'll do a subtract. And now that's been cut out. Okay. That one's kind of different. Might be okay. Maybe I want this background to be a little bit different. So again, new logo, so I can keep working with it. I can try it. Maybe I want this to be a series of rectangles instead. So I could start with my 1400, 1450 again. And let's create a couple new rectangles. Let's say a width of 100 and a height of 1450, sure. Let's change the color. I like to change the color just for reference. Now I can use the align tools. So let me select both of these objects. I'll pick the background object as my key object and I'll move to the aligns and I'll align to the top. And let me make some copies of this. So let's uh, take the purple object, let me copy it and I'll paste it. There's another one. Paste it. So let's say that I like that. Now remember with these align tools, right? I can take all of these objects I could choose the key object being the big square in the background, and I could again align them to the top. I could also use my distributed spacing. I could say, you know what? I want the distributed spacing to be at 100 pixels. And then I know that they're all at 100 pixels, which would then let me take, or let me zoom out for a second. I could take all of these objects and move them back over the top like that. And then I could slice those out if I wanted to. So I could take all of these. Uh, actually, I have to take all the purples and make them a group first. So I'm holding down shift to select them all. Let me right click and say group. Let's make sure that they're aligned to the top. There's my key object, let's align them to the top. And then I could use my Pathfinder and I could subtract the objects in front and I'd end up with those stripes. And maybe that's something that you want, maybe it's not. Let me press undo for a second. So we're back to this place. Uh, maybe I want, or actually let's go forward. Let's subtract those. And then maybe I want something else slicing through it. So I'll create a new shape that goes through it. Like that. And so now I could take all of these and we could subtract that. Oops. Okay, so in this scenario, if I want all of these to act as one, I'm either going to have to group them or make them a compound path. Uh, so let's try grouping them first. Object. Okay, they already are grouped. So in this case, I actually have to make them a, a one, one object. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to go to object, compound path, and then make. That makes those one object. And now I could take all of these and subtract the gap through it and I end up with whatever the end result is. So again, this is all part of this iterative process as we start to create things. Now, maybe you want to work from some kind of a, you know, a creating more of a logo. So maybe you wanna work with an image. So let me create a new background here. Maybe you really are interested in working with a bird or you want a bird for your logo and you know that the type of bird you want is, um, I don't know, a, a, a bluebird. 
So I can type Bluebird. Uh, let's go to images. Right, and so let's say that I like this. Now I want to abstract this, but I want to go ahead and download this image. So let's uh, let's click on it and see if we can get. Oh, that's a copy written. I should have done a uh, Creative Commons search. So let's go in here. Usage rights. Creative Commons licenses. There we go. And let's use this one. Okay, so I've downloaded it. It's in my downloads folder. I could copy this over into my folder for today. So let me right click and say copy. And then let's put it into my flash drive so that I don't lose it. And we'll go into, where are we here? Do a new folder for spring of 2022. And we'll go ahead and paste this. There it is. So let's bring that in. I'll go to file and then place. So just like in InDesign, we can place an image. So I'll go to file and then place. And I'm going to choose that image. And let's place it. And there it is. Now, maybe I want to not use the photograph, but I want to actually kind of trace this shape. So I can do that. And a lot of times it's easy when we're tracing to lock the image layer and then to add another layer on top. And I'll work on layer five here as I trace it. So let's use the pen tool. Let me zoom in. I'll press control plus to zoom in. And I'll start right here at the beak. Actually, I need to zoom in one more level on plus. And this is where all of your practice last class with the pen tool will start to matter. So remember, I'm trying to control this in as few of control points as I can because it's going to make my overall shape a little bit smoother. So let's come to right there. There's a little that. Now see how it's filling with blue. If I want to see just an outline, I can flip my colors, which will help me out here a little bit. And I'm going to not spend too much time on this. So bear with me. I'm not sure how much I want the feet, but. Thank you for your patience on this one. So I am using my single clicks a little bit interchangeably. So a single click may happen at those little joints so that I can create a sharp corner. Put myself back up here.
and there we go and i finished it so now if i were to flip the colors we'd see it as a, a silhouette and i could actually turn off layer four altogether and i'd end up with the bird silhouette there so let me press uh control minus here and kind of zoom out and so i might have that logo and maybe I need there to be some kind of text below it. So remember, I, ex I told you to experiment with text. So let's look here. And let's say it's Bluebird. My font is really large. So let's go in here. And we need to drop this down. Let's go to maybe 500. Oops. There you go. So let's say it's Bluebird. And maybe I want that text to also be that same blue. I could actually use the eyedropper to copy the blue color. And there it's Bluebird. And let's increase that size a little bit more. And, and let's move this over. And let me zoom a little bit there. And now maybe I need to adjust that foot a little bit. So I'm using the arrow keys to kind of combine these together. I think that foot ended up being too big. So I'll go like that. And then I'll come in with my direct select, my white arrow. Let's zoom in here, control plus. And maybe that needs to be adjusted a little bit. So we use my, my white arrow. Oh, come on. And we'll bring that down. And we'll bring that down. And remember, I can use those arrow keys if necessary. So once I get that kind of like that, where those are coming together, and maybe that ends up being ugly, I don't know. Um, again, these are all ideas that I'm doing live and, and flushing out here. But let's say that it's Bluebird. And I have the little Bluebird sitting there. And I'm kind of happy with how this logo looks. Uh, in that context, I probably take the lettering here. And I go up to Object, or excuse me, Type. And then I'd say Create Outlines that creates outlines here, then I would select both of these and I'd use the pathfinder to join them all together so that they became one unit. Uh, and so now that was Bluebird and uh, maybe I need a little bit more text underneath here. I should probably blend this with a sans serif since the main font is a serif. So let's look for a sans serif font. Ideally, I would, I would go in and um find a font pairing that would work but let's say this is more like a hundred and this would be uh still not showing So maybe this is the Bluebird design group. I might even use, now I can't because that, I'm gonna to have to manually align this. So let me go in to my view and I could turn on my rulers. So I'll go to view rulers, show rulers, and I could drag a guide over so that I could see, it's very much like in design and make sure that that's lining up. And again, I'm just using the arrow keys there. 
and I want the design group to be the same blue. So I'll select the eyedropper tool and click on the blue. So I have the Bluebird design group. And this is one of those where, you know, maybe a, a little horizontal line would make sense. So let me see if I can draw just the line segment in between these. I'm going to hold down shift so that it's perfectly straight. And let's make that blue and let's make it like, yeah, let's try it at one point. Move it down just a little bit. And I end up with the Bluebird design group. And again, I just completely made that up on the fly. Uh, and so it may be something that I like or I don't like, but these are the skills that we're kind of playing around with. Uh, today. So I can, uh, I can select that guide now and I can delete it because I don't need it anymore. And I can say, eh, how did that turn out? Do I like it? Do I like it with the line? Do I like it without the line? Remember, you can always duplicate the layer and keep playing with it. So if you didn't like how it turns out, but you were close, right? Maybe you want to try a different font. We could take this layer and we could say duplicate layer five. And now we have layer five copy. We could then work on this and say, you know, I like it without this. And I wanted to change, you know, that design group and I want it to, to be closer and I wanted to change the, the font. And maybe it goes over here this time. Like that. And so now you have different variations that you can look at and say, ah, oh, which one do I like better? Et cetera. It's bugging me that that's not lined up right there. Okay, so this is just different strategies for how you might create your, your logo. I want you to play around with this today. This should be something that's really fun. I hope you have a good time kind of creating this. Feel free to interpret and adapt and uh, create these different logos. You will end up turning in one to Canvas, so pick your favorite and turn it in. Um, I will invite you during the check-ins today uh, and all, well, probably not today because you won't have gotten there yet, but um, the upcoming check-ins to show any of your logos and get feedback on them if you'd like. Um, if you want to adapt based on one of your um, previous logos, that's okay. You can start with something like that. These are, again, just ideas to get you flowing. So create a personal logo for you or for your own company, and then um, you'll post it to Canvas at the end of this lab. Before I let you guys go, do you have any questions? Uh, so this logo design is like, uh, like on the illustration, or like, a, like you did, like with a sentence. It doesn't matter. It's like. No, it can as long as it's some kind of a logo. It could have text. It could not have text. It could have just a, a silhouette. It could, it could be anything like any of the logos that I've shown you today. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. So it's designed to be flexible and, and for you to have fun doing it. Do I have any other questions? No? All right. Well, uh, I'll let you guys go. If you're in the first check-in group, I'll see you back here at 9. Uh, you guys have a great day, and I'll see you on Wednesday.